au Royaume-Uni, en Belgique, vont dire au Canada de mettre fin à ces exportations vers l'Arabie saoudite. Merci. Peggy Mason uh, from the Rideau Institute. There is another important global standard enshrined in Canadian law, and that is the requirement to ensure that Canadian arms exports will not undermine international peace and security. In the original court case brought by our colleague here today, a key document came to light. It was the departmental memorandum providing the rationale for ministerial approval of the LAV exports, which included the statement that arming Saudi Arabia for its role in the war in Yemen would help, quote, to stabilize the region. Whether or not one agreed with that assessment in April 2016, it should now be manifestly clear that supporting the Saudi war effort in Yemen is not a good thing for regional security now, if it ever was. Indeed, the UN expert panel has drawn specific attention to the role of arms transfers in prolonging the conflict. They have called on all third states to end all arms transfers and throw their full support behind the UN-led peace process. In plain English, it is patently absurd at this stage to assert that the con continued provision by Canada of arms to Saudi Arabia contributes to the stabilization of the region. Given the recent dramatic drone attacks on Saudi Aramco facilities, for which the Houthi rebels have claimed uh, responsibility, prolongation of this conflict not only keeps 18 million Yemenis at further risk of starvation and egregious human rights outrages, but also puts the global economy potentially at risk. The Rideau Institute therefore calls on Canada to join the 11 other European countries who have done so to this point and forthwith suspend all existing arms permits for arms to Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much. And I guess we're open for questions now. Uh, now, I am uh, about as good at French as the uh, local hockey team is at hockey, so excuse me if I do. <laughs> Leafs fan, yeah. So uh, excuse me, it's like sorry if you kind of address this in, in any of your answers, but kind of. You know, the, uh, the Article 6 provision that you mentioned earlier, uh, from my kind of understanding, would essentially ban arms sales to any kind of repressive regime. Would I be correct in saying that? It's generally understood to be a case-by-case -case assessment. So it's, it's arms uh, specifically where there is a risk that they may be misused. Okay, yeah. and so just... But, but uh, let me ask, let me ask. That article is a lot about knowledge. If you have the knowledge that arms have been used and continue to be used to breach international humanitarian law, international human rights law, you have a duty, a duty to put an end to those exports. And you know, there is a lot of evidence uh, about those violations and Canada has a knowledge. Other countries have a knowledge. Other countries have decided on the basis of that knowledge to suspend and all their exports. Canada has not done that yet. It has not acknowledged that it has knowledge and it should. Okay. I mean, you know, from my kind of personal understanding, the government would kind of probably hit back at that, saying, you know, we don't have the, we haven't met the threshold to determine whether or not they are being used. Like, you know, <coughs> them saying, you know, there's no evidence that our labs were used in, in Yemen or something like that. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of unclear on the, uh, the threshold kind of discrepancy. Um, so. Well, I'd like to say something to that. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for that. The threshold is risk. It has always been risk. Uh, but even though it has always been risk, the Canadian government has, has couched this phrase conclusive evidence, which appears not once in domestic legislation, which appears not once in the International Arms Trade Treaty. But even this higher 
made-up standard by the Canadian government has been met. And in fact, there is evidence of misuse, both within Saudi Arabia and in the, in the, in, in the, in the Yemen conflict. One such is, instance uh, referred to a security crackdown in 2017 in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, where more than 23 Shia civilians were killed. And this is information in possession of the, the Global Affairs Canada has and, and that they have documented. So the risk threshold has been, it has been met, but even the evidence threshold, which is not not the correct threshold has also been met. And, and if I could just add to that, I mean, for a long time it's been very frustrating for us because on the internet there have been, you know, many, many, many uh, sightings, credible sightings. I mean, the Canadian labs are very easy to identify. They have specific markings. Um, and yet there's been this constant statement, no evidence. And in fact, that position has now changed. I mean, now, um, there, you know, now um, it, it is acknowledged that there is very credible evidence that there are a great number of, of labs um, in operation in Saudi Arabia. Uh, for a while, there was also kind of a, an effort to say, well, the, um, the, you know, the war crimes are only relating to the bombing. Well, the export reports, two UN export reports have made it clear that the war crimes go far beyond, that they involve the ground forces as well, with a whole range, torture, forced starvation, uh, forced disappearance, um, detention, a whole range of, of, of things that would involve the ground forces and therefore um, the labs. So um, on any, I mean, if this, if this does get to court, I think that uh, there'll be plenty of evidence of substantial, uh, of substantial risk. I think we're long, you know, we're long, we're well beyond that. But it's also worth going back to the point I made at the beginning, that one of the rationales, one of the departmental rationales for the exports being granted in the first place was so that Canada could help through the provision of labs to Saudi Arabia to prosecute its war in Yemen. So the government, is, I mean, you know, that was one of the reasons. So to now say, oh, well, we don't know if they're in Yemen. We do know they're in Yemen. The government always, always knew they were going to be going to Yemen. They tried to justify it before. It's completely unjustifiable now. I might just add one last piece on the Article uh, 6 piece. And thank you so much for, for asking this question because I think it's really important to understand that the starting point for any analysis of how the government would respond to this is whether or not those obligations are reflected in Canadian law. And it's very clear, uh, I think, uh, to, to these organizations and certainly Amnesty International, that the Article 6 prohibition is not reflected in Canadian law. This is, a, this is a starting point and it's a problem. And understanding the difference also between the Article 6 prohibition and what's reflected in Canadian law, which is this idea of substantial risk. The prohibition in Article 6 is absolute. There's no discussion or weighing of balancing or mitigation that can be discussed when it comes to arms exports, which the government of Canada has knowledge could be used to commit genocide, crimes against humanity, attacks against civilian. So these are, this is, a, it's a baseline. And the prohibition that exists for Article 6 is absolute. And that's the starting point really for any analysis of our compliance with the treaty, particularly as it relates to Saudi Arabia. And uh, just a little point, because you're, you're interested by Article 6? The knowledge referred to is not the knowledge that Canadian labs have been used in the past. It's about the knowledge of commitment of serious breaches of international law by any country, any uh, party to that conflict. So, you know, there's a very solid basis on, the, on, on, on relying to Article 6 that Canada has to stop those exports because it does have that knowledge. Not that Canadian labs have or not been used uh, by, by Saudi Arabia or other countries or other uh, weapons, but by the UK, by the United States, by any country involved. So that's very important. And that is a commitment that Canada has today because it, the, uh, the treaty entered in force today on the 17th of September 2019. And I've always understood that Canada wanted to abide by its commitments and respect its treaties. I want to add one further point, because there's one other big change in the legislation, and that was under the original guidelines, the human rights guidelines that the, the first court case um, was taken under, 
it, the terminology was unless there is no reasonable risk of use, no reasonable risk of use against the civilian population. And the government had interpreted that extremely narrowly, as literally like the lab would have to run over someone. But that, you know, like be directly used in the commission of the crime. But under, under the new legislation, under both the Arms Trade Treaty and under Canadian legislation, it's it's use or facilitation, use in the commission of. So the abetting, the complicity through assistance is included. There's no narrow, there's no longer this narrow, narrow language of, of use against. So again, uh, that's a very hard thing to argue, of course. The government has never really stood up. That, that This is relevant for the legal case because it's pretty hard for the government to stand up and say, oh yeah, the labs were there doing X and Y, but you know we didn't actually see them do this or that. But nonetheless, in legal terms, the test is now one of use, of use to commit uh, egregious breaches of international law or facilitation of those breaches. Thank you. Just very quickly, if I may. Uh, Good question. In our view, it's a great question. In our view, the risk is real. The risk is, is undeniable. And, but we have, we, we have seen from the government what, what certainly appears to be willful blindness because the information is so readily available for anyone who cares to verify it and to, who cares to see that the government has engaged in willful blindness. The problem now is that we're shifting into complicity territory because the information is so damning, both about the abysmal record of, this, uh, of Saudi Arabia within its borders, but also because of its involvement in the Yemen conflict, then the rhetoric is shifting towards complicity. And this is not just a problem, an issue that has been debated in Canada. As my colleagues mentioned, many of our allies are, allies are having similar discussions and they are, they are either uh, facing legal challenges of or have changed their decision with regards to exports to Saudi Arabia and have, in fact, suspended such, such exports. So we would expect the Canadian government to join the, uh, those allies that have effectively suspended arms exports to Saudi Arabia and to do the same without any further delay. Because every single day that Canada continues being an exporter of weapons to Saudi Arabia, our humanitarian and, an arm, and our arms control credentials are continuing to crumble. I'm going to jump in again just to because we keep talking about these other countries. All of these countries, allies of Canada. I mean, Canada talks about, oh, if we don't sell them, who will? As of today, Austria, Belgium, both they, Austria approves on a regional basis and both uh, regional areas of Belgium. Denmark, Finland, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland have all suspended existing permits. No more exports to Saudi Arabia. In some cases, they've also extended that to the United Arab Emirates. In the UK's case, pending the, uh, the court case, they have um, suspended new licenses. But those 11 first ones that I named have all suspended existing licenses. So, you know, the question now is, is not who has suspended, it's who is the small group of countries left who have not done the right thing. Unfortunately, Canada is still there. We'd like to see them join those that want to uphold international law. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, early, earlier you mentioned the, the, you know, we're morally, logically, and legally uh, unconvincing. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's probably pretty easy for the government to, uh, you know, disregard logic and, and uh, kind of binding international law. But uh, in, in the kind of moral case, they would, I would think they would probably throw, you know, the economic argument at you. Uh, so, you know, we're in the midst of an election campaign. Uh, you know, London is obviously, you know, Ontario, it's an important riding. Um, so just kind of, I'm wondering, you know, overall, how important are uh, arms sales to repressive regimes, like how important are they for the Canadian defense industry? And, you know, are there either other types of weapons, whether they be kind of conventional weapons or something in you know, kind of more cyberspace or something, are there either other weapons or other countries that we could sell to readily that might offset the, uh, the perceived economic impact? I, we, we've already offset it. One of the things that the Rito Institute and others call, has been calling for for some time uh, is is for the Canadian is for the Department of National Defense, which clearly had a requirement for upgraded uh, light armored vehicles, uh, which are very versatile and could be used, for example, also in, in peace operations. We called on them to you know to uh, to move up their contract 
uh, to refurbish, and they've actually done that. So in fact, there isn't actually a pressing uh, jobs challenge at all. This is a very good product. There's a lot of countries that want it. Canada, you know, uses this product. And, you know, the government has a responsibility to workers. That's absolutely true. And they've done the right thing in, in, in bringing forward this, this contract. So uh, the question, you know, so I, I would argue that that, 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 that that always was an exaggerated issue, uh, and, and the real concern is, uh, is with respect to relations with uh, Saudi Arabia and, and maybe not wanting to disrupt those relations, but now that the bigger, you know, in the bigger picture, we've got a, a really serious issue of international peace and security, um, and many more countries standing up and doing the right thing, okay, I think it's a little easier for Canada to join join the pack. I would add that the, the economic argument cannot be raised anymore. It cannot be raised anymore. Even the argument relating to stability, to, you know, political issues cannot be raised because of the new treaty. The new treaty under both Article 6 and 7 creates a duty to stop exports on the basis of human rights violations. So if Mr. Trudeau or others or Mr. Scheer uh, want to argue on the basis of uh, the economic reality or the political stability, they will uh, do something that would be inconsistent with the new obligations that Canada has under the Arms Trade Treaty. And I just wanted to add to what my colleagues just said. We asked the minister's office about it, if they were looking to other venues, uh, other markets to sell the labs. And surprisingly, they said uh, they in their review they're doing actually right now, the permits, they're not doing this, this, uh, this review of different possibilities. So that was a surprise. And considering all the alums we just raised, uh, we thought this was an important issue to look into. Yeah, just on your question, this is not an indictment on the good people in London, Ontario, who work at General Dynamics and who have to feed their families and who are who are who are just doing their jobs. This is a question for the government of Canada, and this is uh, this is an ethical question of linking Canada's economic well-being to predictable human rights violations, war crimes, uh, even if halfway around the world. That is the ultimate question. And again, it has little to do with the folks that are actually employed at this factory. It is the Canadian government who is putting them in this position and the, who is linking the, 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 the manufacturing of this, uh, the, these vehicles to human rights violations and that have been widely denounced, including at the United Nations uh, level. Now, on the question of the jobs themselves, really, if you have the, if you want to have a conversation on the basis of jobs, as, as my colleague Daniel Turp uh, uh, said, it would not be a conversation around compliance uh, with the Arms Trade Treaty because jobs are not a factor in the Arms Trade Treaty. The Arms Trade Treaty does not provide a framework for a balancing act at the national level. It's a, it's a very strict uh, uh, analysis related to risk of misuse, related to human rights violations, et cetera. But neither evidence or, nor, nor, nor reference to economic gains or jobs are dimensions or elements or language within the treaty. Really, this is a treaty intended to reduce human suffering, and that is the context under which it was adopted. And one could easily argue that exports to Saudi Arabia are precisely the type of deal that the Arms Trade Treaty was initially conceived to, to prevent from happening in the first place. And I, and I would just like to add, I mean, I personally as a Canadian find, find it um, intolerable that the argument would be made that Canadian jobs must depend on Canada being complicit in torture of children. I mean, this is just uh, uh, not acceptable. Thank you. Maybe one last thing. Could Mr. Trudeau, Madame Friedland, Mr. Scheer, everyone that's campaigning, just go and read the recent United Nations report of this eminent group of persons to understand what's happening in Yemen and understand that war crimes have been committed and understand that serious breaches of international law and international humanitarian human rights law have been committed and continue to be committed. If they read that report, they should come to the conclusion that 
during this campaign, they would say, it's over. We're not exporting any weapons to Saudi Arabia, but also to United Arab Emirates and to any other country involved in this armed conflict in Yemen. And actually, since the campaign has been mentioned, uh, it is worth, and we of course are calling for action, and we, but we're also calling for the opposition parties uh, to speak up. We know what the position, the NDP and the Green parties have been consistent for a long time in calling for Canada ending um, its exports to Saudi Arabia. Interestingly enough, the, the Conservatives have gone through many contortions on this, no doubt related to the polling, because initially they was very clean cut, they were the original authors of the deal, and oh, of course there was nothing wrong with it. But since then, um, and in, mo in the most recent statements by uh, by the leader, Andrew Scheer, he has actually avoided, when he's been asked on several occasions, what is your position with respect to the exports to Saudi Arabia, he has responded by talking, launching into energy independence policy. So obviously a very good question to ask to Andrew Scheer is, what is his position with respect to Canada's continued complicity in war crimes through its exports to Saudi Arabia? Thank you. Thanks. Oh, great. Great.